Hello, this is Dr. Marvin Becker again, continuing in our radiology uh, review uh, for the Dental Assistant National Board. This is chapter number 39 in the, the textbook that, you're, that we're constantly using here, and it follows up chapter 38 that was shown on the first presentation. The first, uh, first uh, chapter in 39 talks about dental film and processing radiographs. Film processing has a direct effect on the value and the quality of the picture. One may take an excellent x-ray of the patient and not process the film uh, properly and regardless of how well your picture was taken, the, the end result may not be acceptable. Now, <clears throat> we're going to be talking about film in this chapter. In, in later chapters, we'll be talking about digital where most of dentistry is converting at this time, but there are still many, many dental offices that are utilizing film and you need to know and understand how to process the film and the difference between film and digital and all the ramifications thereof, okay? Uh, the dental assistant has to be knowledgeable about the types of film and the film holding devices. <clears throat> must also thoroughly understand the processing procedures so that we get the best quality of picture for the interpretation by the doctor as an end result. Film is the correct term to use before it has been processed. The film is in the packet and the film is placed in a bite block and the film is exposed and processed. After the film has been processed, and we'll cover that in great detail in a few moments, it is then called a radiograph. Very similar to the days when people were using cameras to take pictures um, many of you probably don't know what a camera and film is anymore because everyone has switched to digital, uh, digital cameras, but it's basically the same process and the processing of the film is done the same way. Holders today must be used whenever taking radiographs in the dental, in the dental environment. There are a wide variety of intraoral film holders are available. And a basic film holder is the disposable styrofoam uh, block, which uh, we covered in, in this picture. Um, and that can be used routinely for taking bite, bite wings and also some of the periapicals. Uh, we have other holders that are used for taking individual uh, procedures, including the endo, endo ray device uh, when uh, doing radi radiographs for endodontic procedures. And then there are a variety of other uniblock devices that are utilized. But no longer can a patient hold the film with their finger in the mouth, which was common practice up until the late 70s, early 80s, 1980s. Um, the exposure to the patient then is grossly uh, magnified, and it is no longer acceptable for the patient to hold the, the film in their mouth by themselves. This is called the snap array. The snap array is one of my favorites and it's used ex extensively with children because the XCP system, which we'll detail, uh, is used routinely in adults. It, it's a, um, it is an uncomfortable procedure for the children to, to bite upon and many times we'll use the snap array. The film is placed in the snap array and the patient bites down to it. You don't get quite as an accurate quite as accurate a presentation as you do with the XCP, but it's uh, quite acceptable when utilized appropriately. This is called the end array holder, and it's used when doing root canals, and it helps to modify or adjust the length of the procedure within the pulp canal itself. Now these are the, p the pieces and the parts of the XCP. Uh, the mechanism that we'll be teaching and showing to you clinically in the in, in our uh, office presentations and each one each of these parts fit together whether it's an upper right and upper left lower left lower right uh, they're somewhat interchangeable but they have to be put together in a precise manner and we'll be teaching you that clinically when we get back to the chairs okay Film used in dental radiography is photographic film that has been adapted for dental use. A photographic image is produced on the film 
when it is exposed to x-rays that have passed through the teeth and adjacent tissues. <coughs> when the, the, the wave of radiation has gone through the patient and exposed the film, there is an image on the film prior to your processing it. That image, however, you can't see because it has not been processed. And when it comes out, it's called the radiograph. It is a film until we've placed it in the processor and carefully uh, prepared all the uh, procedures to make it into a, an, an image. Before the film is processed, the image on the film, which one cannot see, is called the latent image. And the latent image is very similar to when we put our fingers on the, the countertop and we play, take our hand away, our fingerprints are not visible on the countertop until the, the person comes along and dusts the, uh, the, the material where you can visibly see the fingerprints. You see this on the television shows of the constantly when they're dusting for prints uh, on all the cop shows. And it's very similar. The image is there, you can't see it until it's been processed. And the x-ray film is exactly the same thing. Again, that's called the latent image. Intraoral fil dental film is made up of a semi-flexible clear cellulose acetate film base that is coated on both sides with an emulsion of three silver materials. Silver bromide, silver halide, and silver iodide. And all of them are sensitive to radiation. When the radiation interacts with the silver halide crystals in the film emulsion, the image on the film is produced. The image is not visible, as we said, and is called a latent image. <clears throat> Another type of latent image is obviously we talked about fingerprints. Film speed refers to the amount of radiation that's required to produce a radiograph of standard density or darkness. Speed is determined by the size of the silver halide crystals, the thickness of the emulsion, and the presence of special radiosensitive dyes that are incorporated into the emulsion that covers the film acetate. The film speed determines how much exposure time is required to produce the image on the film. A fast film requires less radiation and the film responds more quickly to processing because the silver halide crystals in the emulsion are larger. The larger the crystals of the silver halide, the faster the film speed is. This is a same principle as film speed on photographic film for those of you who are still using film uh, for, for, for your cameras, which is somewhat, air, somewhat rare. The box that the intraoral film comes in has a couple of critical information uh, things that you need to know about. One, it tells you the number of film, it tells you the speed, and most importantly, it tells you the expiration date. On the expiration date of this film, film box, <coughs> that is a drop dead stop, stop action date. It's not like a sell by date that you would find in the supermarkets with milk or cottage cheese or whatever. And so when, when that film is, says that, that the expiration date, it is malpractice to take, take a picture of a patient with film that expired even that day. Because after you've exposed a patient, we won't know whether that film is going to be appropriate for reading until after we then process the film and the patient, although we can take the picture over again, that's caused that patient to be exposed to radiation once again unnecessary. And so it's always a drop dead day. There are three types of x-ray film used in dental radiography. The first is called intraoral film, the second is called extraoral film, and the third is called duplicating film and each one is specifically different. Intraoral film is named because it is placed inside the patient's mouth during the x-ray exposure. The intraoral film has, has emulsion on both sides of the film uh, and it requires less radiation to produce an image. 
to protect the film from light and moisture, the film is packaged and, re and, and is referred to as the film packet. The, the, the packet are generally come in boxes of 25, 100, or 150, and the film packet may contain one film, or it may be a two film or a two film packet. The purpose of that is that many offices will use the two film package and keep one of them as a record to be, to be sent to the patient or to referring doctors rather than having to duplicate the original. Somewhat similar to when you go to the photo places where they will make two copies of the same print uh, for, for almost the same price as one. Um, the boxes of film are labeled with the following information, the type of the film, the film speed, number of films per individual packet, and the total number in the box. And the film expiration date, which is probably the most important piece of information. On one corner of the film is a small raised bump known as the identification dot. What, that film expiration date is a drop dead date. Film should never be used beyond that date because we won't know until we process the film if the emulsion has gone bad on that film packet. And sure, we could take the picture over again if it's not acceptable, but the patient then is being exposed to radiation a second time totally unnecessary. So the date of expiration is not like buying a quart of milk that says a sell-by date. This is a drop-dead expiration date. Inside the film packet, we have the, the, the cover, uh, the black paper, that's the black paper film wrapper inside the film is a protective sheet that covers the film and, sheets, and shields it from light. The thin lead foil sheet is positioned behind the film to shield the film from backscatter radiation, secondary radiation. And so you have to be careful always to place the film with the packet facing toward the exposure uh, rather than reversed. And it's very simple to understand when you see the tab on the back of the, of the film packet, that always goes away from the exposure or from the uh, tube head. The outer packet wrapping is a soft vinyl or paper wrapper that seals the package, protects black paper, and, and the lead foil sheet. And you'll get some exposure to this in the offices as we open up a package of a film uh, exposing it so you can get to see what this looks like directly in the, uh, before we place this in the patient's mouth. The sizes of the film. We have several different sizes of basic film. We have the O size, which is the child size picture. We have the narrow anterior, which is the number one. We have the adult size, which is called the number two and which is used most routinely. And we have preformed bite wing film number three and the occlusal film, which is number four. Going into extraoral film is one that is placed outside of the patient's body during the x-ray exposure. The x-ray films are used to examine large areas of the head and the, and the jaws. And we use these, the two most common used, commonly used films in dentistry are the panoramic film and the cephalometric film. A panoramic film shows a panora panoramic view of the upper and lower jaws on a single radiograph. A cephalometric film shows the bony and soft tissue areas of the facial profile. So this, this is a panoramic view of a patient, and it's always labeled left and right because we need to know how, how that film was exposed in the material. And as you can see, you've, you notice all of the teeth, all of, both of the jaws and many other structures, but all of them are not as clear or as, de as defined as individual intraoral films. And so a combination of the intraoral film and the extraoral panoramic make a wonderful survey on patients. Now in children, we frequently will do the panoramic film looking for the eruption of different teeth. This patient has a third molar on all four quadrants or each corner that 
appear that in some sometime in the future are not going to have enough room and will probably need to be extracted, those wisdom teeth. But it gives us a position of all the different teeth, any extra things like extra teeth, cysts, tumors, malignancies, etc. So the panoramic shows a, a very use serves a very useful position in dentistry, but by itself it is not complete. The cephalometric picture shows the, the, the head and the, the entire skull and both jaws, and it is used primarily in dentistry in the orthodontic department. Because as we're beginning to set up for orthodontic treatment and move of the teeth, movement of teeth, we want to evaluate whether the upper jaw is forward or the lower jaw is backward, and what would be a, cosmetically and functionally the best way to approach the, the, the patient to give them the most functional as well as the most aesthetic look that they that we can achieve. Extraoral radiograph radiography uses a film screen system. This means that the film is used in combination with intensifying screens. Ex Extraoral film is supplied in boxes also in 50 or 50 to 100 films and most of them come in 5 by 7 and 8 by 10 inch sizes. Extraoral film is not supplied in film packets because they're taking from the box in a, uh, a light sealed room like the dark room and they're placed, the film is placed inside of the intensifying screen or holder. These are the different types of boxes that hold the film and depends on the size of the film and what we're going to be doing. The cassette which holds the film <coughs> as shown above, you take the film out of the, the box in a light secured place and you place it inside of the cassette. The cassette is plastic or metal and it's used in extraoral radiograph to hold the film and protect it from exposure to light. Cassettes are available in rigid or flexible styles depending on the manufacturer of the radiographic machine that one is using. To, to, to tell the patient's left from the right, as on intraoral films, the front of the cassettes must be labeled L and, R, and R for left and right. And the front, front side of the cassette must always face the patient during exposure. An intensifying screen intensifies or increases the effect of the radiation and thus <coughs> decreases the amount of exposure time needed. The intensifying screen is coated with a material called phosphor that gives, gives off light when it's struck by the x-ray radiation from the, uh, from the cassette. The film inside the cassette is sandwiched between the intensifying uh, screens and it's affected by the light pr produced by the phosphor and the radiation. There is a s slight loss of image detail as a result of this uh, intensified beam, but the radiation effect to the patient is m more than half or less than half uh, of that taken without the intensifying screens. Two types of screens, one is called the green sensitive. This type of film is used with cassettes that have rare earth intensifying screens. And the blue sensitive, this film is used with cassettes that have calcium tungstate intensifying screens. And they're coded to the type that a manufacturer of the x-ray machine that one is using. Uh, this, this slide uh, shows the intensifying screen with a hard, hard cassette. But whether you use the hard or the soft, the magic to the, to the uh, panoramic or extra roll is the intensifying screen, which does a remarkable job of, of increasing the exposure to the, to the film and reducing the exposure to the patient. Duplicating radiographs. If you do not use double film, which in most of our practices we do when we were using film. We've converted everything to digital, but if you come to a practice that's still using film, uh, two films 
just makes it such you don't have to copy the x-ray. We already have a pre-done exact uh, duplicate. Um, duplicating, is film, duplicating film is used only in a darkroom setting and is never exposed to x-rays. The, uh, the original x-ray film is exposed to radiation to give the image. The duplicating uh, x-rays uh, film uh, is, is produced by white light sensitive to the film. Very similar to making a copy with your Xerox or copying machine. The paper is exposed to light when you push the button. Well, the duplicating film does the same thing. And there are small boxes like this where the film is placed on the, the cover of the duplicating machine. You close it, close it down, and push a button. Light from a bulb inside the machine exposes that film to the, the white light and it makes an exact copy of the x-ray that was placed on the, the surface. Again, we're more and more going away from this because as you go digital, we'll cover that in, in great detail later, or you can make as many copies of a digital exposure as you like without having to do any process, procedures whatsoever. Dental x-ray film processing. And this is a very important portion of making the picture that you took very readable and uh, useful for the doctor for diagnosis. Processing is a series of steps that changes the latent image on the exposed film into an x-ray by producing a visible image on the film. Proper pr pr processing is just as important as taking the picture because if the processing is inadequate or done incorrectly, the, no matter how well you took the picture, the image will not be useful. There are five steps in processing dental radiographs. First is development, then is rinsing, then comes fixation, then comes washing, and then comes drying. And each one of these steps is very, very important in the effectiveness of processing the film. Developing is the first step in processing, and a chemical solution is used called the developer. Okay, the purpose of the developer is to chemically react <coughs> and to reduce the exposed silver halide crystals into black metallic silver. This developer solution also softens the film emulsion during the, the, during the process. Rinsing is important. Films necessary to remove the development from the film to stop that process so that development uh, it does not go beyond the limits of what it should have been. If you're doing this by hand, agitating the films as we used to do in, in the olden days of dentistry, it has to be done for a minimum of 20 seconds. And this has to be done under safe light conditions in a dark room. Fixing is an acidic fixing solution that removes the unexposed silver halide crystals from the film emulsion. The fixer also hardens the emulsion during the process. For permanent fixation, the film is kept in the fixer for a minimum of 10 minutes. Now this is all, as I'm referring to now, is strictly by hand developing. Today, almost all offices that are still using film will have automatic processors that I'll describe very shortly. And the whole process then takes six to eight minutes to complete. Washing again is important. It, wash, it, it follows the fixation and the water bath is used to film and if you're doing this by hand, it takes a minimum of 20 minutes of washing to stop the procedure and, and to give you a clear picture. Drying, the final step, is, is, is the drying of the films, and this can be sometimes an overnight procedure. As you can see, in the olden days of dentistry, we're using film without processors. The x-rays were taken, and many times were not read until the next morning. It was always a problem, as I was enter practice many, many years ago, that we would take pictures of a, of a child and read them wet, holding the film up to the light, and I would tell the parent and the child, oh, everything looks pretty good. The next morning, I always read the films as they had dried overnight, 
And it was heartbreaking when I would have to call a parent and a child and tell them, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't see it on the wet film, but Johnny does have a cavity. Um, and so that those, thankfully, those processes are long gone from, from the world of dentistry. Okay. Film processing solutions are available as powders, as ready-to-use liquids, and as liquid concentrate. The dark room, very important if you're using film. The term light tight is often used to describe the, the dark room. That means that no light, no white light can be present. When you're in the dark room with the light turned off, no white light should be seen and the dark room should be checked periodically to make sure that it is not leaking light through cracks or places in the ceiling. X-ray film is very sensitive to visible white light and streaking and ruining the film if there's any exposure to it. Dark room lighting, we do have overhead lights in the dark room to make it easier to manage and this is called a safe light. A safe light is a low intensity light in the red-orange spectrum and it leaves enough uh, light so that one can, can see and work in the dark room without giving any white light to the film. Processing tanks, as <coughs> we have the developer, we have the fixer tank, we have the rinsing tank, and then um, after all that is done, we have the, the drying process. Requirements of a dark room, they have to be clean at all times. Infection control items, gloves, disinfectants, and paper towels must be kept clean and removed from the surfaces because there's more liability in a dark room for exposure to the operator from uh, disease infection particles than virtually any place else in the dental office. Because you're working in the dark, the film has been in the patient's mouth, it's coated with their saliva, sometimes their blood, and the, all of this needs to be handled very, very carefully. And so the, uh, the OSHA requirements and the infection control requirements are as strict on taking an x-ray as they are on working on a patient. And in fact, we can control infection control the infection, infectious process better on an extraction than we can in processing an x-ray film because there's a lot of motion going back and forth and ultimately we're ending up in a dark room. The automatic processor. processor. The, the, the film is processed and is fast and simple method used to process the film. Other than opening the film packet, the automatic processor automates all film processing steps. So it goes through the developing, the fixing, the washing, and the drying, all mechanically. Automatic film processors take only four to six minutes to process the complete process and dry, whereas manual processing takes an hour and sometimes longer than that to dry. The automatic processor maintains the correct temperature of the solution and adjust the processing time. In the morning, someone comes in and turns the processor on and waits a few minutes before processing any films because the temperature of the solutions in the processor is critical to the clarity of the picture. Between roughly 68 to 70 degrees is the ideal temperature for processing film and the automatic processor has a heater and a cooler that will bring the solutions up and down depending on the overnight temp temp temperature of the office where the automatic processor is located. Okay. <clears throat> processor uh, housing covers all the component parts and we have internally essentially the same things in a processor that we have in the hand tanks but it is all done mechanically. The advantage of the automatic processor is obviously much, much less time Number two, time and temperature are automatically controlled so you get a uniform density of the picture. Three, less equipment and much less space. You don't even need a dark room. There are automatic processors that have sleeves where you can place the processor on a tabletop 
and managed to process the x-rays rather than in the dark room. Processing areas may occur for a variety of reasons. Time and temperature is the primary processing error. Chemical contamination, the developer and a fixture are not kept separately. Film holding errors and lighting errors. All of these can, can, can be modified and need to be correctly handled so that the end result is a film that is radiographically diagnostic for the doctor. 